ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونثوب اليه من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده فجازاه الله عنا خير الجزاء أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدث بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقول الله عز وجل في محكم كتابه بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قد خلت من قبلكم سنن فسيروا في الأرض فانظروا كيف كان عاقبة المكذبين Many societies have passed away before you So travel the earth and note the fate of the deniers. And he said, هذا بيان للناس وهدى وموعظة للمتقين. This is a proclamation to humanity and a guidance and advice for the righteous. And he said, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ لَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ And do not waver, nor feel remorse. You are the superior ones if you are believers. ويقول, إِنْ يَمْسَسْكُمْ قَرْحٌ فَقَدْ مَسَّ الْقَوْمَ قَرْحٌ مِثْلُهُ وتلك الأيام نداولها بين الناس وليعلم الله الذين آمنوا ويتخذ منكم شهداء والله لا يحب الظالمين If a wound afflicts you, a similar wound has afflicted the others. Such days we alternate between the people that Allah may know those who believe and take martyrs from among you. Allah does not love the evildoers. Brothers and sisters, as we are starting the new Hijra year of 1445, it is important for us to reflect on the state of the Muslim Ummah today and ask ourselves how we can be a force of good in this world. We need to review our achievements and failures in a critical but fair perspective. Not exaggerating defeats and not to exaggerate successes. We need to have a balanced and accurate view that will allow us to deal with the weaknesses and prove on the success and seize on opportunities. So what have we achieved as a nation of Muslims around the world in the last 120 years? Have we achieved something important worthy of mention that can be counted in our record and can elevate us among the nations in history? What are the key failures up to today that are impeding our progress as a nation of Muslims? Ayyul ikhwa wal akhwat al-yawm bi munasabat al-sana al-hijri al-jadida natadarasu ma'an نجاحات وإخفاقات هذه الأمة وما هي التحديات التي تواجهنا اليوم ترى ماذا يكون دور المسلم المسلمين في الألفية الثالثة الجديدة أيكون لهم مكان تحت الشمس أم يضلون في ديل القافلة كما هو اليوم يستهلكون ولا ينتجون ويستوردون ولا يبدعون ويستقبلون ولا يرسلون 
وَيُقَلِّدُونَ وَلَا يُجَدِّدُونَ We are not here trying to be pessimistic, brothers and sisters. And history have taught us that civilizations and the leadership of different civilizations is cyclic. Some civilizations rise and then they fall. Others come and replace them. There's always going to be somebody leading the civilization in humanity. What's unique about the Muslims is that they tend to keep coming back, even after huge defeats in their history. وَدَوَامُ الْحَالِ مِنَ الْمُحَالِ وَهَذِهِ يَسُنَّةُ التَّدَاوُلِ الْكَوْنِيَةِ الثَّابِتَةِ الَّتِي قَرَّرَهَا الْقُرْآنِ فِي قَوْلِهِ إِنْ يَمْسَسْكُمْ قَرْحٌ فَقَدْ مَسَّ الْقَوْمَ قَرْحٌ مِثْلُهُ وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ وَلِيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَيَتَّخِدَ مِنْكُمْ شُهَدَاءُ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الظَّالِمِينَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Imran, Al-Imran verses 140, If a wound afflicts you, a similar wound have afflicted the others. Such days we alternate between the people. الإخوة والأخوات يوما ما كانت الاتحاد السوفياتي قوة ضخمة وتملك ترسان هائل من الأسلحة النووية والتدميرية وجيوشا جرارة مدربة مستعدة ومع هذا لم تغن عنه هذه القوة وهذا هذا الاتحاد لم يغن عنه هذه القوة العسكرية شيء وإن وانهار هذا البناء الكبير وكثير منكم عاش قبل وبعد انهيار الاتحاد السوفيتي لأنه أسس على شفا جرف انهار فانهار بأصحابه والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين and these brothers and sisters Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alternate between people civilizations do not last because of their military and economical might alone those are important but by themselves alone they don't keep you as, as a leader there must be spiritual might in addition to the materialistic might the spiritual superiority does not mean religion alone but it also it should include ethics, intellect, knowledge, and other human meaning that humanity have agreed on. Well, sisters, we Muslims, we have many religious and worldly signs as a glad tiding for a bright future. But we have to put the work for it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change the state of people until they change what's in themselves. وَإِنَّ لَدَيْنَا نَحْنُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنَ الْبُشِّرَاتِ الدِّينِيَ وَالدُّنْيَوِيَّ مَا يَمْلَأُنَا ثِقَةً بِالْمُسْتَقْبَلِ وَيَقِينًا بِغَدٍ أَفْضَلِ وَلَا يَعْنِ ذَلِكَ أَنَّنَا سَنَنَامُ عَلَىٰ آذَانِنَا ونتكل على هذه على هذه البشائر بل يجب ان تحفزنا هذه المبشرات الى العمل والعمل الدؤوب المبني على العلم والتخطيط حتى نحول الاحلام الى حقائق والامل الى واقع مشهود ومن جد وجد ومن زرع حصد ومن سار على الذرب وصل ولا يغير الله ما بقوم حتى يغيروا ما بأنفسهم Brothers and sisters, today I am inviting you to join me in a reflection with ourselves as members of this beautiful faith and nation of Islam and take a stock of our achievement. The intent of taking this stock is not to put ourselves down, feel pity, or beat ourselves up. Without doubt, there are many major achievements for the Islamic Ummah. 
that we have seen over the history of this uh, of this ummah. We cannot ignore and diminish others. Uh, diminish otherwise, we will uh, fall into the state of despair and hopelessness. Most of these accomplishments, brothers and sisters, are the fruit of the people's work, not the ruling regimes. It's the masses who have made this happen, with some exceptions. This is a scary phenomenon, as it was reported in the authentic hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, that was reported by Abu Huraira, that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا ضُيِّعَتِ الْأَمَانَةِ فانتظر الساعة قال كيف إضاعتها يا رسول الله قال إذا أسند الأمر إلى غير أهله فانتظر الساعة When the leadership is given to people who do not deserve it they're not qualified then that is another sign of a الساعة When trust is lost then wait for the hour as the hadith say Abu Huraira said How is the trust lost? He asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, the Prophet said, when authority is given to those who do not deserve it, then wait for the hour. So when you see and you study the, the history of civilization, they start, they go up and then they collapse. How long they stay? Some civilizations stay a thousand years or thousands of years. Others were a blimp in the history. Let us now talk about some of the achievements of the Muslim Ummah in this last 120 years. Injazatu Ummatina fil Qarl Ishirin. Awalan Akbar Injaz wa Taharu mil Istiamar, wa Tishar Ta'lim, wa Dhur Harakat al Ihya wa Tajjid Islami, wa Mukawamat Taghrib wa Ghazul Fikri, wa Tilakat Sahwa al Islamiya. First is independence of most Muslim countries from Western and Eastern imperialism as a result of many popular uprising and the struggle for independence. And this is not to be taken lightly. Second is the expansion of schooling and education in all Muslim countries, cities, and villages. Birth of many Islamic reform movements and individuals. This movement used Islam as the source of their reform. And they were inspired by the hadith that says, Inna Allah yab'atu li hadihi al-umma ala ra'si kulli ma'at sana man yujaddidu laha deenaha. Indeed, in the hadith, indeed Allah sent to this umma every hundred year who renew its deen. Now, it doesn't have to be an individual. It could be an entity, a movement, an organization. So people get stuck, oh, who is that? Who is the reviver? It's not. And scholars actually have explained this hadith with many versions of this uh, hadith. The renewal of the deen in this hadith means a renewal of its understanding. We're not going to come up with new deen. It's the same deen. It's the same faith, same religion. But it's reviving our understanding of the deen. A renewal of the belief in it. A renewal of practice in it, of teaching it, a renewal of the methods of da'wah, of calling for it. The fourth uh, uh, good news that we've seen in the last 120 years or so is the youth Islamic awakening. When I was a child, when I go to the masjid, only old people go to the masjid. Those who are my age, they know that. Now, mashallah, the youth are fiercely competing with senior citizens in, in their spot in the masjid. They're there, they're volunteering, they're taking the, the right causes, they're putting their uh, life and, and, and time at risk, they're, they're, they're sacrificing. Back in the days, you go to Hajj when you're about to die. You know, you work all your life and you wait until you die, like you, you, like you can't even walk. And then you say, well, I think I'm going to go to Hajj. Now I see you going to Hajj all the time. This is a new phenomenon. We should be grateful for it. But sister, history has shown that this ummah has survived many tragedies and setbacks since the beginning of its history. To the point that people questioned its survival and that the believers were severely shaken. Even while the Prophet was among the Sahaba, a feeling was 
that if they have not survived Ghazwat al Ahzab, the battle of the ditch, Islam wouldn't be here. Or even in the time of Abu Bakr, when some uh, 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 munafiq, some people who left Islam decided, oh, um, we're not going to give zakat. And they're going to rebel against, uh, and they came up with a prophet of theirs to compete with the Prophet Islam after his passing. And, but, but the Muslims stood uh, firm about that. And we, in every uh, test, we think this is it. And we feel that now. When we see the challenges of today, that, that's it for Islam. But it's not. It's not. We have to understand our history. If you don't understand your history, then you cannot benefit and you cannot see the vision forward. What are the key failures that are impeding our progress as an ummah? So we talked about some good news, some achievement. But what are the failures? I wanted to propose for you 10 important failures that the scholars and thinkers and activists who work in this field have gathered. The first thing is the loss of the Muslim global leadership, al Khilafa. The second is the failure to confront the Zionist project in Palestine. We actually, rather than resisting this, we're joining them now in normalizing relationship one country after the other. The third failure is the journey of progress and development. We're really behind. The fourth is failure to gain independence from foreign dominance. We got the physical independence, we kicked off the colonialists, but we are very dependent of them. They appointed our leaders and they keep appointing them. They actually tell us who's going to be our next successor. The fifth is failure to implement shura and freedom of expression in the community. Six is failure in bringing about the unity of the ummah. We're very divided. Seventh is failure to bring about social justice. Eight is failure to look after the women's rights. And people, when you say the word women's rights, they say, oh, feminist. Uh, no. Forget about it. Even if the West have never happened, we are miserable in how we deal with our women. Failure in the spiritual and ethical outbringing of the ummah. We're really detached of our teaching. Failure to anticipate the danger, and this is an issue that is in the front of everybody's head, is homosexuality and gender identity. But sisters, having enumerated uh, these failures of the ummah over the last 120 years, we need to uh, get to work and tackle them with our utmost energy and hard work. There are many challenges that must be faced. And in the second khutbah, inshallah, I'll allude to some of these challenges. I'll say this and I'll say this and I'll say this. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ba'd. These uh, challenges that the ummah is facing today, brothers and sisters, are wicked challenges. They're difficult. They're not tame. They're not straightforward. That's why they're sticky and they're hard to shake off. We must pri pr prioritize these wicked problems and adopt new processes for them. If we keep doing the same thing, we should not expect different results. At the Hawiyah, the challenge of identity, where we must be clear of our identity and who we are as people and who do we belong to. Do we have a, a, our own personality or do, are we just followers and imitators? Are we leading or just following? We are Muslims, brothers and sisters. We have a mission and a universal call to humanity. A call which is distinguished by its lord lordship, by its humanity, by its ethics and by its mercy. And we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy to the words. We have to be proud of this identity, which is a clear identity, the clarity of the sun in the middle of the day. 
Unlike what we see today, brothers and sisters, of the recent sexual and, and decency and transgressions that emerged through the sexual revolution in the West, and the challenges of gender ideology that people of faith have found themselves challenged and not knowing what to do with it. Brothers and sisters, a fierce immoral propaganda has taken place over the last 34 years that claimed to be defending at first a minority of gay people, but has resulted in ideas devoid from reality and biology and science. Like that, that claim, and I'm going to quickly give you some claims. I want you actually to go beyond the excitement and the anger about this phenomenon. It's fine to go and rally, but if you don't understand what the LGBTQ word means, then you shouldn't be anywhere of that issue. Study, read, understand what is the history. How come these people are so dominant, are on our face, uh, they're pushing their ideology under our throat? Why? What makes them so powerful today? They say people's sex is a spectrum. You know, there is the male, there is the female, there is something in between. It's not just a male and female as we all knew it. They say that the biological sex is a social construct. A parent and the community decide, well, we're going to call this one a boy and a girl. So it's not really real biology. They say that and preying on the misfortune of some minority people who have gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is when you have a person who is male, but tend to like to do what girls do, kids, or vice versa. A girl, she likes just to play soccer, do what the boys do. That doesn't make her homosexual or something cr crazy. It just makes her that. She likes to play like that. What they say, they prey on that situation, and, and in some extreme cases, require therapy. They don't require that we confuse the, the kids that is confused, and we push them through to more confusion. We find that what they call gender affirming care. A child is confused, and they say, well, you have to believe your child. Five, six, ten, thirteen. Believe them. If they tell you today I'm an astronaut, then say, yeah, you are an astronaut. Tomorrow they're firefighter. Yeah, you are. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow they're uh, today they're, they're boy. Tomorrow they're girl. Or undecided. And we have to affirm. And you know what they tell the parent? They tell them if you don't affirm your child's choice, they're gonna commit suicide. Now, if you're a parent and and you're talking to a professional therapist. And they're telling you this stuff is so predominant in psychology. It made the rules of the professional organization in this field that you have to affirm your child choice. So basically, this is based on two assumptions. I want you to actually capture these key ideas and paradigms. The first assumption is that this gender uh, identity movement claim that children know best who they are and they should, we should affirm their choice. Uh, your child says, well, I want ice cream now. And you give them ice cream, then you want burger, then they want this. It's a child. If you go along with everything they ask you to do, you're gonna hurt, they're going to hurt themselves. You're the parent. And you're going to continue to be the parent until they reach the age of maturity. And even beyond. We don't <laughs> retire from being parents because our children become adults. No. This is not what we do here. That's a concept in the Western, it's a deviant concept in the Western society. Now, a uh, uh, man should become a man at a certain point, right? You can't just be dependent on your uh, parents all the time. The other issue, besides saying, well, you just have to confirm your child's uh, uh, choices, is that it is possible to be born, they say, it is possible to, bo to be born in the wrong body. We know you as a girl, biologically, but they say, well, maybe you're a boy just born in the body of a girl or vice versa. I don't know where they come up with this stuff. We never, we never heard this stuff. These are pure fiction and myths have nothing to do with science, nothing to do with reality. When it comes to identity, in this gender identity move, movement, they tend, I want you to hear me well, 
they tend to separate three things that should not be separated. In Islam, the identity of a Muslim is not about their sexuality. They separate and la haya fi deen. Anybody who's worried about why we're talking about this, this is part of the deen. There, there is sex, there is reproduction, and there is marriage and morality. What they tell you, oh, these are separate things. For us, it's not separate. You love somebody that you care for, you marry them, and you have children. And that's a part of this whole process. They say, no, no, why are you bothered? Two people like each other, they are adult, it's consensual. Then who, who are you to, uh, to object, even if they're not married? See, they are separating the morality from the action. And they totally neglect. People, are, we're, we're going to be extent because they don't care anymore about having any children. Not that they care about the environment. Because some people don't want to have children because the environment is not good for that. No, because of this gender identity. The other thing, so they're, they're separating things that should not be separated. But they amalgamating things that should not be amalgamated. For example, they will combine desire, action, and identity. So if I'm somebody who like ice cream, then I want you to call me the ice cream man because I like ice cream. So they make my identity is my desire of that thing. Well, I am more than just ice cream. Yes, I like ice cream. But I am a father. I am a student. I am a son. I am a community member. I have a lot of things in my identity as a Muslim. I'm a worshiper. I'm a slave of Allah. All this they, they, they ignore and define you based on sexuality. This is the weirdest thing that humanity have ever seen. These are huge uh, innovations that they created. Now, they don't make no sense, this thing, but the way they actually propagated this, not based on uh, uh, convincing us, is based on using psychology. I'm not making this up. They have a book that was written in 1989 by two professors from Harvard. That one of them is neuropsychologist and the other one is a, uh, a, a marketing executive. And they wrote the book on how America is going to, how, how America, and, and, and they're referring to the rest of humanity as the straight. Because they're the homosexual and we are the straight. And they had conquered a plan on how they're going to dominate the place. And they are, all their plans have been executed nicely. Nicely, badly, immoral approach. The first challenge I was talking about today is the challenge of identity. But we, we don't have time to cover all of them, and I invite you uh, to think through this. We have a challenge of reference. I mean, where, where do we bring our decision from? We have reference as a Muslim, Al Quran, authentic Sunnah, and Al Wasatiyah Tafkir, and science. We Muslims believe in the power of science. We don't go against the teaching of science. And the whole pandemic thing exposed so much ignorance in our community. Sadly, we never go to the doctor and say, oh, why are you giving me this medication? Can you prove to me the clinical trial that you've done? Why are you giving me this the drug? We never did that. But then when it came to pandemic, we, everybody become a doctor and scientists and telling everybody what to do. Oh, why do we have to be? Oh, you're, you're trying to stifle my, ex, my freedom of expression. That's why you're putting mask on me. They don't know that in Islam, if a ta'un, if a pandemic is in the city, you're not allowed to enter it and you're not allowed to exit that town until the issue is resolved. But then they can lie to you. The third challenge is the challenge of research and development. Our ummah is investing nothing in this. You know how much the Zionist, gov Zionist government invests on this? 4.9% of their GDP, more than U.S. U.S. invests 2.7% of their GDP in research and development. You know the highest of all the Muslim countries is Malaysia. Malaysia invests 1.3%. Don't ask me about the rest of the Muslim country. Then when you look at the graph, and this stuff is public uh, information on, 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 on uh, international organ organization that actually tabulate this thing. The challenge of social justice. The challenge of Muslim women right. I mean, this requires, and we've done khutbah on this before, inshallah in the future we'll talk about because this is very important. Women are 
half of the the Muslim community, and if if the women right, uh, it, it's a it's a strategic uh, uh, challenge for this ummah. Our sisters have been discriminated against, even in the masjid. After COVID, we, we had lockdown, and when they reopened the masjid. My, I was coming with my daughter to the Juma. The first Juma after they reopened, they stopped me at the gate. They said, sorry, brother, no sisters. I said, what? My daughter, she's an adult now. She grew up in that masjid. Who g- and they gave the women's section to the man to acquire what? Because we were distancing 12 spots. Unbelievably backward. What if actually we flipped it? We say, what, the man, sorry. We don't have enough space for the brothers today because the sisters, we have too many sisters today. Just come back next week. I mean, what is this double standard? And then they go to you, oh, she's not required to make salat in the masjid. And they make up all kind of stuff. Prophet Islam say, do not, do not stop Ima Allah from Masajid Allah. Challenge of tyranny in our Muslim countries. Every country is a dictatorship, one after the other after the other. Even those who does, don't look like dictator, they are dictator. I mean, use your imagination. Challenge of spirituality and ethics. Challenge of Zionism, and I alluded to that. Challenge of division. We are very divided globally and divided here in this small community. We are few Muslims here, and we cannot agree. I've been actually sending emails and messages to the community leaders to get together so we could discuss this issue. And they're just fighting with each other. Accusing each other of all kinds of unbelievable accusations. If you disagree with them, they call you an LGBT uh, sympathizer, a Zionist. Literally, they're attacking one of the sisters who's been working here all her life. Taking, she's a 1,000 man. She actually helped all kinds of refugees, Palestinian refugees, uh, Syrian refugees. And then the attack they're giving her because she dared to say that the way you're doing this protest is not right. She's not against the cause. She's just telling them the way you're doing it is wrong. Where are the men who allow other men to attack a woman? And they're silent. I sent an email to the leadership and I say, if you are standing by watching this and you're not at least speaking against it, you're as guilty as the one who are attacking the sister. Threatening her life. She's a single Mother, threatening her life. She had to go to the police to seek protection. The challenge of globalization. We're now just a second thought in the plan and the agenda of the big countries. The challenge of religion and religiosity. We have the, the touch these two. I mean, people are big into religion and citing the texts of Islam and whatever. When you look at them closely, they don't behave like a Muslim. We don't behave like a Muslim. We have to bring these two back together. Brothers and sisters, these are the main achievement failures and challenges as seen by scholars, intellectuals, and activists. We should all ask ourselves, what is my role? This is not somebody who's going to fix it. There's nobody going to fix it. Everybody, young, old, need to step in and say and ask themselves, how can I contrib- contribute in a humble way? You're not going to fix everything. You're not going to fix... Somebody talk about Palestine. I say, Palestine, just fix your ethics first, <laughs> your akhlaq, and then we can talk about Palestine. Hey, make salat on time. Then we can talk about Palestine. You know, don't cheat people on their uh, in the business. Then we... How can, you, uh, how can you fix anything global like that when we, as the personal level, we don't display the Islamic uh, behavior. We cannot do it all. But we should ask ourselves, before I leave this world and, and meet Allah, what am I going to tell him? What did I contribute to uh, uh, get us out of these challenges? أقول قولي يد واستغفر الله لي ولكم اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا وصرف عنا الشر ما قضيت إنك تقضي ولا يقضى عليك وإنه لا يعز من عديت ولا يدل من وليت تبارك ربنا وتعاليت اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وأقم الصلاة